If you have your Bibles, I'm going to be in 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. As you, as you get there, because here's, by the way, I don't, I'm not, I'm going old school today. I didn't have slides on purpose because I want us to lean in. I hope you take some notes. I hope you lean in and say, I, I, got, I got to get something from God this morning. And as you find the scriptures in 1 Kings 19, I just got to ask you a question this morning. Are you okay? Are you okay? I had a friend in college who used to annoy me with that question. Because he would say, are you good? But he wouldn't stop there. He would double down. Are you really good? And it's like, oh, come on, man. Like, we're going to do this right now in the hallway, <laughs> going to class or going to cafeteria. I'm trying to get some food here. No, no, are you, are you really good? And he would do this often because he knew we like to give quick answers because so, we don't want to deal with things. So he had to stop and double down like, no, no, are you, are you really good? And then a few years later, we graduate and we move on with our lives. And I get a call from this friend of mine. And he wasn't good. He had made some poor decisions that affected not just him but his family. And as I'm talking to him and he's confessing these things and he's like, man, I just want to let you know how I'm doing. When I hung up with him, you know what I thought about? I thought about, man, we, maybe we didn't do a good job asking him if he was good. Maybe that was his way of saying, maybe, guys, maybe I'm not good. Maybe I doubled down because I'm not good. See, we have a tendency to just put on masks and try to move on. But I hope today we can stop for a second and really answer this question. Are you good? Are you okay? Because sometimes it's okay to not be okay. All right, turn to your neighbor tell me, are you okay? Are you okay? This is where we're going this morning. I've been sitting on this talk for a minute now. It's been brewing in me for a while. And so I pray that it, it, it encourages you as it's been encouraging me. First King is going to be a long read, but I got to let the scripture speak for itself first. It starts in chapter 19, verse 1. It says, when Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done. Previous chapter, prophet Elijah goes to war with these false prophets of Baal for over who is the real God. And he wins this fight. And he defeats these 400 false prophets. So this is what this context is. So Ahab, the king, is telling his wife Jezebel, hey, we, all our prophets are gone. Elijah annihilated them. He killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me. If by this time tomorrow, I have not killed you as you killed them. Verse 3, when Elijah was, Elijah was afraid and fled for his life, he went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and left his servant there. Then he went, home, he went alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary, solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. Here's a prophet coming out of an incredible victory, which he prayed for fire to come down from heaven, and it did. And now he's praying to die. Are you tracking? He says, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was, a, was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. He's depressed. Verse 7, then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more. It's like a Portuguese angel. God's like, send the Portuguese one. Is that how you guys read the Bible? That's how I read the Bible. 
Tens que comer, Elias. Tens que comer. Get up and eat some more. Or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai. 200 mile journey. The mountain of God, that's where another word for Mount Sinai. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, tore down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. By the way, that, that preaching clock is not right. You got to reset my time. I haven't even stopped preaching yet. Verse 11. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was a, such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out. And stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Verse 15 Then the Lord told them, Go back the same way you came. And travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Azael to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nishim, to be king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel Meholah, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Azael will be killed by Jehu. And those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet, I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kiss them. That's the word of the Lord. Can you say amen? Are you okay? This is one of the major prophets of the Lord. This is prophet Elijah, a man who prayed for rain to stop and it stopped, a man who prayed for fire to come down from heaven and he did. And here he is coming out of an amazing victory in the Lord. He's coming out of defeating 400 prophets. And he, he was feeling so confident in his faith in this moment. If you go back a previous chapter, he's even making fun of them. Because he's like, man, let's see who's the real God over this nation. And he told them, he said, you guys can go first. And go ahead and pray to your God. And he even made fun of them. He said, uh, maybe your God's in the bathroom. He can't hear you. Which is a great, what a great dig. Like, I, I like Elijah for that. He's talking trash. He's feeling good. And he prays. And God answers his prayer. Fire comes down. Elijah wins. And then, one chapter later, Elijah is afraid and he's running for his life because a woman named Jezebel wants to kill him. My friends, please hear me on this. We are most vulnerable usually when we come out of a great victory. We let our guards down usually when things are going well. We are most vulnerable immediately after a great victory. He's coming out of a great victory but he doesn't realize this is the moment that he's most vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. Pay attention to your confidence level when things are going well. Pay attention to the battles that you will face the moment that you come out of a victory because the enemy is looking for a way in when you least expect it. 
He's a great prophet. He's a man of God. He knows how to fight. He's not afraid. But here, he's overwhelmed with fear. Because his guard is down. Be aware, friends who just got baptized. After a great baptism comes a great temptation. Be aware, young people who just came back from a great youth retreat. After a great retreat comes great temptations and trials to try to push you back to where you were in the first place. Be aware, the moment you said, Jesus, I want to follow you, all hell will break loose on you because it's trying to bring you back to hell. But you got to say, hell lost another one. Be aware, married people, the moment you say, let's renew our, our commitment to each other, here comes hell. You're most vulnerable right after a great victory because your guard is down. The moment you said, I want to go through radical mentoring for 10 months, all hell will break loose on you because hell will rather you be a complacent, lukewarm Christian than to be a man of God who's taking care of his family and his loved ones. And if you're not in tune with what's happening, you might find yourself wanting to quit when you're actually in the brink of a breakthrough. You're most vulnerable after a great victory. Because he knows, I want to catch him or her when they think they're winning. Are you tracking with me? Elijah wants to quit. I don't know if you caught this, but in verse 3, he literally said, I am done. Not only did he say he's done, he makes a couple of interesting decisions. He runs to Beersheba, which is 80 miles away from where he was. 80 miles. And he tells his servant, which is basically staff, Because every prophet had a servant with him, his staff. And he says, listen, stay here because we're done. This ministry is over. Beware of making decisions when you're vulnerable. We're done. This ministry is done. A ministry that's been successful. A ministry that has seen miracles. When was the last time you called down fire from heaven? I'll wait. When was the last time you said, it ain't going to rain for three years, and it didn't rain? I'll wait. So this dude has has seen major things happen in his life, and now he's had enough. He leaves his staff behind, and he says, I'm done with this. It's over. I'm quitting. God, I'm the only one left. Listen, I've had enough. He's emotional. He's depressed. He wants to die. He runs 80 miles to isolate himself. Sometimes you don't run 80 miles. Sometimes you just run in your basement. Sometimes you don't run 80 miles. You just don't show up anymore. Sometimes you show up, but you're not there. Physically, you're there, but mentally, you're not. Because you reserve to quit in a moment of vulnerability. This is the same guy who prayed for rain to stop, and it stopped. He prayed for fire to rain down, and it rained down, and now he's praying to die. Same guy. Ironically, he never dies. I don't know if you know this. The only two people in the Bible never died. He's one of them. He goes home in a chariot of fire. God's like, I'm not even going to give you that. <laughs> There's a great song by one of my favorite writers, Rich Mullen. He says, it's called Elijah. And the song says, when I leave, I want to go out like Elijah. And I told my wife, when I die, play that song. Don't cry for me. I'm going home. I know where I'm going. He was disappointed. Get this. He's disappointed with God. The same God that... Lens his prayer, chapter before, now he's disappointed. 
we may not say it out loud, but a lot of us are disappointed with God. I thought it was going to be this way. Not only is he disappointed with God, he's disappointed with ministry. He left his staff behind. He's like, we're done. This ministry's over. Because of a moment of vulnerability. He's about to throw everything away. Because after a great victory, you are most vulnerable. My friends, if we're not paying attention to our souls... We can easily go from being victors to victims overnight. He's a victor in chapter 18. He's a victim in chapter 19. Just like that. Because of a moment of vulnerability. What's interesting to me about this passage is how God responds to Elijah. This is is really what I've been spending so much time understanding. How God responds to a man who says, I'm done. Man, you let me down, God. Ministry is over. Like, I've had it. I'm tired. Like, I'm just completely done. And I'm thinking the first thing that God would come and rebuke this man. It's like, man, I just answered your prayer. You prayed for... Fire, and it, and, it, and, it, and it came. You told me you don't want the rain, and then it let it rain. But we don't see that. What we see is very, very interesting the way that God responds to us in our moments of vulnerability, in our moments of weakness, in our moments that we're tired, and we're sick and tired, and we're tired of being tired, and we're thinking, you know, some of us, because we grew up in religious homes, we're thinking, God's going to be angry at us, God's going to be upset at us, and then the way God responds blows my mind. God sends the Portuguese angel. You don't expect that. Tell me that's how you would have responded to Elijah if you were God. I'll wait. Why is it that God, the first thing God does is send a Portuguese angel to wake him up because he's depressed. All he wants to do is sleep. If he had Netflix, he would just want to watch, binge watch. Because he's depressed. God says, send the angel. Because why? Because God knows you're tired, man. You're tired. And that's okay. We're going to replenish you. You're tired. Isn't that amazing? The stuff we say when we're tired. Stuff you would normally not say if you're not tired. Decisions that we'll make when we're tired, that normally you would not make those decisions. If you ever find yourself making a decision when you're tired and hungry, and you look back and you're like, what the heck? He said, you're tired. You need, you need to be fed right now, Elijah. You just need to eat. So get up and eat. God's first response to Elijah is, Elijah, you're a triune being. You have a body. That body's tired. Let's start there. See, I struggle sometimes when we've been in church too long. If we have a tendency to over-spiritualize things, sometimes you just got to eat. Sometimes you just, listen, I heard a preacher say this, and I love this. He said, man, sometimes you don't need a sermon. You need a sandwich. You need a good nap. Man, now that I'm 44, I wish there was mandatory naps. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? All right. Like, he says, hey, just eat, bro. But now... Here's something that you, you have to be aware of who you are because some of us eat our feelings away. So this is important to catch this part because some of us, it's, it's not just eat, is why are you eating? By the way, these are Jewish people. They're eating kosher. He didn't say go to McDonald's. <laughs> That will preach. Some of y'all, you don't need to rebuke the devil. Rebuke fast food. 
this is too real, right? It's like you're waiting for something like over the top, supernatural. God's like, send the Portuguese angel, break him some bread and some water. We are triune beings, and you will see through God's answer, God's trying to touch each one, the physical, the mind, and the spirit. He starts with the physical. He says you need to replenish yourself. Sometimes you need a sandwich, not a sermon. He's about to send him the other way. He ran 80 miles away. He's like, listen, Elijah, we're going to meet, but we're going to meet at my mountain. And that mountain is 200 miles away. You know why? Because he had already lost 80 miles because he made a terrible decision in a moment of vulnerability. You know how many times we, God has to make a detour for us because we made a wrong turn and God's like, now we got to go the other way, but in order for you to go the other way, i got to replenish you. It's like, man, we got a long journey ahead because we're going to talk about this, but guess what? We're going to talk about this where you belong. Can't run away, Elijah. By the way, that's a long journey, which means, see, see, I don't know how you see the Bible, but it's so practical. He says, start with eating, right, nap again, because he said, get up and eat, let him eat, and he's like, go back to bed. You need to replenish. Then, I need you now, get this, to get on this track for 200 miles. In other words, are you working out? Y'all ain't ready for this. You can't go 200 miles if you're not in shape. See, we over-spiritualize things. Sometimes it's not another prayer meeting. Sometimes it's the treadmill meeting. And the way we respond tells me this is what's wrong with us sometimes in the Christian realm. Everything is over spiritual, but treadmill is very spiritual too. <laughs> Y'all ain't gonna talk to me today. Are you okay? Forty days. By the way, every number in the Bible is on purpose. Forty day journey. You know what forty means? Completion. In other words, 40 days of recovery. See, here's our struggle. We want overnight fixes. God is into overtime recovery so you can truly be fit and fixed and well. Imagine you went on a 40-day journey of eating well and taking care of your body and then go meet God in his mountain. What could happen if we just took some practical advice from the way that God dealt with a man who was depressed and suicidal? Mental health is such a big issue in our society right now, but my struggle with the way society enters mental health is everything is pharmaceutical. It's all, here's another pill, pop another pill, pop another pill. No wonder we're all addicted, but we're not free. There's a pill for everything. A pill to make you go to bed, a pill to make sure you get up. <laughs> and we're pumping our spiritual temples. We're toxic. No wonder we're drained. And no wonder we're toxic. So we're not taking care of the temple the way that he intended. Once he nourishes him physically... He asks them a, a question that you would think, this is God. Why is God asking someone who he already knows, what are you doing here? What is that all about? If you read the scriptures, you know that from time to time, God will end, ask a very, like, dumb question. Jesus says to a crippled man, do you want to be well? And you're like, you're God. He's crippled. But you have to understand that it, there's beauty in that. What God is doing is, God is trying to make you take ownership of where you are. Imagine healing someone who doesn't want to be healed. 
Because I'd rather people pick me up every day. I'd rather be on welfare. I'd rather be a victim. Like, don't make me a victor. Some of us are so stuck in a dysfunction, we identify ourselves with the dysfunction, not with the victory that can come from being healed. What are you doing here? He's trying to get him. Are you aware? What are you doing here? Hey, Adam, where are you? Uh, uh, now he's moving on, my friends, from the physical. Not where are you physically. Where are you in your mental state? What are you thinking? What's making you make these decisions and choices? This is, where, this is what God is doing. God is allowing Elijah to vent, and hopefully by venting, he gets to the bottom of it. That's so good. He's not mad at his venting. He's giving him room. See, we over-spiritualize everything. Some people don't think God wants to hear you vent. Have you read the Psalms? Psalms are basically venting. God, where are you? I am so disappointed. God, you left me. God, how come these enemies are winning? How come the wicked seems to prosper? Venting! He's okay with your venting. He has no problem with you venting. But he knows that if you vent with him long enough, you ain't going to stay in venting. <laughs> I got to stay there. See, my friends, honest prayers is what leads to honest breakthroughs. It's religious prayers that keep you stuck in religiosity. Because some of us, God is still waiting for the real you to talk to him. God is still waiting for some of us to just say what we really feel. Because some people are praying, God's like, I can't recognize that. That's not who I created. Thou heavenly Father in heaven. <laughs> Hallow be thy name. God's like, you're not Shakespeare. I created that dude. He was awesome. <laughs> but you ain't him. I think some of us, we miss God because we're not real with him. We're just not real. God, I'm sucks right now. My wife told me not to say suck, but God never said that I can't <laughs> say suck. Right I love that God gives him permission to speak freely. You know you're in good relationships when you can speak freely. I don't know about you. I don't like being in relationships when I have to feel like I'm walking on eggshells. I told the staff of this church many times, like, hey, if I can't be myself, then I don't want to be the pastor of this place. If I have to be on eggshells and speak religiously and not say things like, this sucks. Because some people want you to be in a box. You're the pastor. This is the way we go to church. This is the way we go. <laughs> like we do in these classes, Emotionally Healthy Discipleship. And, and part of the, the, the class is that stop trying to correct people when they tell you how they feel. Yes. If they feel it, they feel it. Now they could be wrong in their feelings. We're going to see that in one moment. <laughs> Just so you know. God's not going to cause a sign of your feeling, but he gives you permission to feel. You're allowed to feel. Because you understand what God's asking this question? Your thoughts are shaping your behavior. Every decision that you made started with a thought first. Every thought that is not checked will lead to an action or a reaction sooner or later. What are you doing here? I want you to take ownership of your thoughts. You have permission to speak freely, but you got to own your feelings and emotions. Amen. That's why he asked him twice, what are you doing here? He says, I'm the only one left, and we know this is not true. Because later on, we know God's like, only you. Like, I got like 7,000 of you. 
But you know what happens in our feelings? Tunnel vision. All I see is my hurt. All I see is my disappointment. All I see is that I am not getting my way here. Therefore, I'm the only one. The only one that worships you, Jesus. I'm the only one who prays. I'm the only one who gives. I'm the only one. I'm the only one. Are you done yet? But you're, you're allowed to speak freely. But also know that your mind can play tricks on you. That your mind likes to narrow your vision so you become a victim instead of a victor. This is why he's running 80 miles away to isolate himself. The worst thing you can do in your moment of vulnerability is isolation. Because now you're left with yourself, by yourself, with your own thoughts. That's why he's like, I'm not going to deal with you in Beersheba. I'm going to deal with you at Sinai. I'm not going to deal with you in isolation. I'm going to deal with you in community. Because in isolation, you are your worst enemy and you make excuses for yourself. It's in isolation that we blame everybody. It's in isolation that we generalize things. It's in isolation that we will make a hurt an identity. It's in isolation that now my theology is being shaped not by a God that can do all things, but I'm being shaped by a hurt that's disappointed me and made me left hungry, bitter, resented, disappointed. It's in isolation that statements come that are not true. I'm the only one. No one cares. No one reached out. All churches are the same. All men are the same. All women are the same. All jobs are the same. Except for me. Zero ownership in my feelings. We victimize ourselves when we're hurt. Please pay attention. When you're discouraged, your perspective is slanted. When we're discouraged, we lose perspective. So God says, let's go deal with you in Sinai, not in Beersheba, in isolation. So eat well, rest, get back on track, exercise, because we've got a two-mile, 100-mile track, 40 days, because I need you to recover. When he gets to Sinai, he says, go out and stand on the mountain. Go out and stand where we can meet, where we can talk. This is, he goes from physical to mental to spirit. I'm going to take care of you physically. I'm going to deal with your ment- mindset. Now let's get in your soul. Let's get in your spirit. Mind body and spirit. You're a triune being because he's a triune being. He says, now let's deal with your spirit. This is time for silence and solitude. This is time to listen, not to talk. I gave you permission to speak freely. Now allow me to speak freely. See, that's the struggle with our prayer life. It's all one way. We tell God everything we, we, we air our laundry, we tell him what he needs to do, and then we like, good talk. God's like, I didn't get a chance to. And then we go, where are you? He's like, I don't know, can I talk? I gave you permission to speak freely, can I speak freely? Go stand on the mountain and wait for me. And what's interesting is, what God does, again, God just baffles me. Because our thoughts are not his thoughts. Our ways are not his ways. God puts on this display of power. And Elijah's like, yo, I know that because I've seen you rain down fire. I've seen you not let it rain. I've seen all of that. But God this time is like, let me show you you don't know me. I'm not in any of those things right now. It's a major lesson. I hope this is a mature word now. 
Be careful that you don't equate God with a past experience when God's trying to do something new in your life. This is a major hurdle in our spiritual growth because a lot of us are stuck in something that God did in 1985. And God moved on. Some of us are still talking about God's experience, but in a past tense, not in a present tense. I remember when I was on fire for Jesus. Yeah, what happened? If anyone moved, it was you. Oh, maybe you didn't move. You stayed stuck in a past experience where God is trying to give you new experiences and new perspectives and new understanding of who he is so you don't put him into a box of thinking, I know how God works, because God will go outside of that box and do something you didn't expect him to do. Oh, that's a word. I know, I know church people, well-intended church people, who are still praying for God to send revival like he did back in Reformation period. But the problem is, God never does the same thing twice. God is too unique, too creative to keep doing the same things the same way. So we get disappointed with God, we get disappointed with ministry, we get disappointed with church, because like, it doesn't look like it did in 1985. It's not supposed to. Some churches, you walk in, it still looks like 1985, like literally. <laughs> still singing, shout to the Lord. Nothing wrong with that song. But man, there's new songs that God's birthed. New things for us to worship. New ways for us to engage God. Shout to the... Great song, by the way. What's wrong with that song? Nothing. I'm just saying, can God move on and give us fresh revelation, fresh songs, fresh worship, fresh praise, fresh way? Still sliding. You know that little sliding thing? You see your mom's finger on it, trying to worship. You know what I'm <laughs> God's like, I gave you guys iPhones. <laughs> We're rebuking things that God gave us. <laughs> Hello, somebody. <laughs> God is not always, this is what God is trying to make a point here. This is so powerful because this is, it jacks me up. God is not always in the dramatic. He can do the dramatic, but he doesn't have to. I went to church last week. It was amazing. I was crying. I felt goosebumps. Yeah. This week, God's doing something new. God's not real based on your goosebumps. He's God all by himself. You got people moving on from good things because they didn't feel a certain way they did six months ago. You don't have a good marriage based on honeymoon. Uh, Y'all ain't ready for this message today. He don't love me no more. We're not happy. Who told you you're going to have that honeymoon freaking feeling all the time? And by the way, who the heck can sustain that? That's hard to sustain. Mary, you know, yeah, I'm just going to leave it alone. Sometimes people are like, you know, church is not what it used to be at Keith. Good. Thank God. Then God is not what he used to be because God is on the move doing new things. He said, behold, I make all things new. I make all things new. That's why I love the fall. God says, man, enough with the summer. Let me bring some bright uh, leaves into this thing. Let me change the atmosphere. Let me change the landscape. Let me change things. He's doing all things new again. But I like the summer. <laughs> I don't like winter. God's still like, I don't care what you like. <laughs> Reminds me of the woman who said, I didn't like worship today. I didn't like those songs. Francis Chan, a preacher who I love, said, good, because we weren't worshiping you. 
Because <laughs> church people are funny like that. Pastor, I didn't like when you said that. Good. Maybe I was trying to offend you. Have you ever thought about that? I'm offended. Well, that was the point. You missed it. <laughs> hey, it's amazing how we try to make this thing about us. He's like, man, I'm not in the wind today. I'm not in the fire today. I'm not in the earthquake today. I'm coming with a gentle whisper. It's not always about flair of the dramatic. In other words, you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, listen, because you keep looking for signs, you miss me. You're looking for goosebumps. You're looking for this. You're looking for that. Some people will travel looking for conferences, looking for this, looking for that. And they look for signs and they miss the very God who's in present, in gentle whisper in front of us. Fire from heaven in the previous chapter, gentle whisper in this chapter, because he's God. I don't know how you pray every Sunday, but I pray, God, come as you pleased, but please come. It's not up to me to determine how God comes. It's up to me to be in tune with how he's speaking. God speaks, get this, this is powerful. God speaks to the human heart in the gentle whisper because he knows sometimes displays a power miracle is just a moment, but a gentle whisper in your heart is for eternity. I've seen people get miracles who are no longer walking with Jesus because they got a miracle, but they never got Jesus. I've seen people get healed from cancer and walk away from church. Why? Because they got the what the diagnosis they wanted, but they didn't get the heart. So be careful when you're asking for miracles, but your heart is not attached to the one who gives the miracle. Ten lepers get healed. One comes back. He says, where are the others? They got what they wanted. But he's like, you got what you needed. You got me and you got healed. Some mature word. Some people come to church just to get what they want. They don't come to church because they want God. That's why I said earlier, we think coming to church is being a Christian. We got a rude awakening coming. Coming to church is a byproduct of being a Christian, but it doesn't make you a Christian. If you're not actually devoted to Him, submitted to Him, and contributing. Not just consuming. Consumerism is capitalism. Contribution is Christianity. Now let me wrap this up. Because we get to this place. God speaks in a gentle whisper. Elijah thought he failed. Because God asked him again, what are you doing here? And he, he's got this rehearsed thing. You know, I, I, I did everything you asked me to do. You know, I'm the only one left. And no one's listening. He's rehearsing the very thing. He thought he failed because why? Oh, man, this is a mature word. This is what God's been messing with me because we have the wrong ideas of what success is. I'm learning in my older age because it takes, I'm a slow learner. That God, God definition of success is very different from my definition of success, very different from our society definition of success. In our society, success is all external. For God's, God's economy, success is internal. Success is are you being faithful and fruitful in the way that I created you to be, and you're not being anybody else and doing somebody else's ministry that I called you to do. And that's maturity. But we no longer allow people to define success for us. But God defines what he means to be successful. So what does God do? <laughs> I love it. He says, go back where you came from. In other words, took care of you physically, took care of you mentally. I've shown you that I'm not into the dramatic. I can speak to your heart. I want to heal you, restore you. Go back, man. I don't know who I'm talking to, but go back. 
Go back to your marriage. Go back to your kids. Go back to your ministry. Go back to your community. Go back to where God called you to be. Let's go back. One time he, he healed a dude that had demonic spirits. Dude was like, let me go with you. He's like, no, no, go back home. Go show them how good this God is. Go back home. Go back where you came from. Back to basics. Because when you're vulnerable, you make dumb decisions. Go back where you came from, Elijah. I got an assignment for you. Watch this. He says, go back. I have work for you to do. And he lays out his work. He says, go back and anoint this dude. Anoint this dude. And uh, by the way, anoint your successor. Oh, that's a tough one. Hello. Because you don't know you're successful unless you have a successor. You don't know you're a disciple of Jesus unless you've discipled somebody. The, I believe it from my heart. The greatest revelation that if you really follow Jesus is who followed you. Because Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. See, the struggle with us in this generation that I'm seeing, we equate spiritual maturity with everything that Jesus never talked about. People talk about spiritual maturity as in Bible knowledge and, and, and how, much, how, much, how much time I had in church. And, and look at me. I know theology. And we fight theology. Look at my YouTube page. Look at this. And no one is talking about, but who's your successor? Who are you leading to Jesus? I tell you, be careful because I'm hearing this stuff a lot. It's not maturity at all. It's actually very immature. To talk in terms of, look at me, look at my theology, look at my doctrine, look at me, look at me, look at my YouTube pages, look at my views. And it's like, man, where's the heart of Jesus in all of that? I see more division than I see unity. I see more being right than I see being righteous. It says, go back, anoint these people. By the way, anoint. Not only am I anointing my successor, this is so good. I pray you, pay, pray you catch this. He says, I'm giving you a friend. Because you need a friend, Elijah. And they walk together for some time. I don't know. You got to read the Bible and see that Elisha becomes a friend of Elijah. Because he's been doing this for too long by himself. He's isolating. God's like, I'm going to kill two birds with one stone. I can't say that. That's politically incorrect. <laughs> it's the time and place we live in. Peter's going to come after me. Um, but he's like, I'm giving you a success. I'm giving you a friend. Because life is always better in pairs. You know why that's important? Because this, it doesn't mean just because he had this moment with God that all of a sudden he's not going to be depressed anymore. By the way, can we get that out of the way as well? Immaturity says, I just need one moment. Yes, the Lord can do a lot in one moment, but life continues. And you're going to have bouts of depression. You're going to have bouts of suicide. But guess what? Now you've got a friend. You've got someone to lean on. You've got someone to pray with. You've got someone that's going to help you. God hits him with this. Oh, by the way, that whole like, you're the only one left? I got about 7,000 of y'all. <laughs> I love that. Because we think we're the hero of the story. And that's our problem. We think we're it. We're the hero. I've been there. Look at me, God. God's like, yeah, you and many others. And that's humbling. Because we want to be it. I don't know if you understand this, but I, I don't want to mess you up, but I will. <laughs> if you leave, God's got 10,000 more like you. <laughs> <I don't, laughs> my pastor, I love my pastor because he's so, he's so practical. He's like, listen, don't you understand? For every person that leaves the church, God replaces it with 10 more. <laughs> How freeing is that? By the way, if you're in a relationship, you're not married, right? You're not married. But if, but if you're in a relationship and your security is like, I'm leaving. <laughs> Don't tell me you're leaving. I'll show you the door. <laughs> to the left. <laughs> Never threaten me with leave. Just I'll show you the door. No, I'm speaking. Mature word here now. 
Don't tell me you're leaving the church. Just go. Just go. God bless. We've got work to do. There's 7,000 of us still saying, God, don't be done yet. You're not done yet. 7,000. In other words, I don't know if you understand this, but he's a, he's a by, those 7,000 as a byproduct of his ministry because he was the main prophet. So this wasn't God just rebuking him. This was God encouraging him. Listen, you're looking at the wrong way, man. Because of you, there's 7,000. They may not be 7,000, but look around you in your, own, in your own neck of the woods. Because of you, there's five. Because of you, there's 10. Because of you, there's 20. Because of you. Don't overlook your influence. You're where you are for a reason. And when you quit, you gave the devil permission to wreak havoc. I don't know about you. I am way too deep in this to quit. And when I think about quitting, I think about what Peter said. Peter is my favorite dude because Peter, was, he tells it like it is. Jesus was like, yo, y'all going to quit too? He's like, where are we going to go? You ever had an honest prayer with Jesus? And you're like, man, yeah, it feels like quitting, but where, where am I going? You know how dumb I would look? Go back to what? Sometimes you just have to have that honest prayer. Like, I feel like quitting, but like, the options though, like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you ever have an honest conversation with God? And you're like, man, I feel like, man, I would not mind quitting. Every Monday I feel like quitting. <laughs> By Monday night, I'm like, well, I don't know what now. <laughs> Y'all don't want a real path. This is the way we go to church. This is the way we go. Yeah. Uh, you invest in people, people backstab you. Hello. Of course you want to quit. But what is the alternative? <laughs> he said, you have the word of life. Where else are we going to go? Where else are we going to go? Because my worst day with Jesus is better than any day without him. I tell you that. <laughs> where are we going to go? Let's stand together because I can talk about this all day, man. Are you okay? You're going to be okay now. You got the tools to be okay. You got the means to be okay. You have the resources to be okay. I feel confident in this. If you come to this church, we're giving you all the resources in the world. What you do with it, that's on you. It's on you. I can't, I can't cook and put it in your mouth. I feel like I, I cooked a great meal this morning. It's up to you. He said, what are you doing here? He's like, man, go back to focus. Go back to work. Because I don't know about you, man. Just showing up week after week, that's boring. I need to work. I have work to do. Matter of fact, I think that's where we get in trouble the most. Idle mind, man. Devil's workshop. When you got stuff to do, it's hard to make you quit. The youth asked me a question. They said, Pastor, how do you not fall into temptation? I said, you don't focus on temptation. I don't walk around going, I, I don't want to mess up. I walk around going, I love Jesus, and I just want his will. I want his purpose. And the, the other stuff is just the other stuff. When I got work to do, I don't have time to tell you how you're not doing yours. I'm busy. I got stuff going on to be telling you how you're not doing it. <laughs> he says, back to purpose, man. Go anoint the people I'm asking you to anoint. Go get your successor and a friend, by the way. Because you're going to leave a legacy, Elijah. And I'm going to take you up in a chariot of fire, but your boy Elisha, woo, watch what he's going to do. Watch what he's going to do. I'm finding out on this journey is more about where I'm becoming and who I'm taking with me. That's true success. That's what matters. 
physically, mentally, spiritually. That's how you get back to being okay. I've been practicing this prayer. It's called a pause prayer. If you, got, if you, if you want a tool to help you, look up this app. It's just literally called pause. And this man has done wonders for my spirit. To just pause for five minutes with the Lord. You can pick a minute, you can pick three minutes, you can pick ten minutes. You are at work, you're having a rough day, go, go to the bathroom and pause for a minute. Pause so you don't make dumb moves when you're tired and vulnerable and frustrated. And I want to practice pause with you right now in this moment for two minutes. Would you bow your heads with me? We're going to pause. And the way you pause is you take a few deep breaths. Every breath you take says spirit. Ruha, spirit of God. Numa in Greek, spirit. I breathe the presence of God. And then I release. I release everything to God. I pray a simple prayer like Jesus, I give everything and everyone to you, Lord. I give everything and everyone to you. And depending on the day, I'll release things that I know are causing anxiety or stress or worry. I release everything and everyone to you, Lord. Where else can I go, Jesus? You have the word of life. Take my temptation to quit. Jesus, I'm tired. I feel so vulnerable. I feel angry. I give you my anger. I give you this frustration. I give you this anxiety. I've even thought about dying. Help me be aware of your gentle whisper. Speak how you please, God. I, I just want you to speak. However you feel like speaking, I'm listening. But whatever you do, don't pass me by. Don't pass me by, Jesus. Heal me today. Heal me from deep wounds in my spirit, in my soul. Heal me from resentment. Heal me from bitterness. Heal me, Jesus. I give everything and everyone to you. I want to be able to say it as well with my soul. Not everything in life is well, but Because you're God, I trust you're working everything out for my good. It is well. It is well. <laughs>